But thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, thank you, Hagrid, and uh, thank you, Catherine and Hagrid. Um, thank you to everybody for being here, and thank you to Nisha for that wonderful presentation. I hope to be uh, close to a level where I can compare uh, my uh, uh, with with your incredible presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a great pleasure for me also to be here uh, with uh, with Nisha as well because it's been a long a long term uh, friendship, as she said. Okay, um, so before uh, can I just check that you all can see my presentation that everything is okay? Uh, um, it's not yeah. full screen. Okay, let me try to get in full screen. Now? Yes, that's good. Perfect. Okay. So before I start, I would like briefly to mention the academic boycott happening now at the University of Leicester due to a process of redundancies that many of us feel to have been conducted irregularly. For these reasons, I come to you today as a member of the University College Union. And if you would like more information about this situation, please do not hesitate to contact to ask me about the event. Um, having said that, I would like to start by disclosing that I don't really study migration in an Islamic idea. My focus has always been cultural change and Islamization. However, in the last two years, I have been a bit more involved in the question of migration because I have made some calls for its reconsideration in the debate of Al Andalus. My argument is that we cannot really understand the transformation of culture in this period in Iberia without considering migration with a bit more attention. So please don't leave. I promise you will find this interesting. Grab some tea and cookies or, or beer if you prefer. Um, I hope that you enjoy. Okay, so it is well known that in the last wave of the expansion of the Umayyad Caliphate, less than 100 years after the start of the Islamic era, the Muslims conquered Iberia, which they called Al-Andalus. They took over most of the territory in three years, 711 to 714, and a long period of Islamic presence in Iberia started, so 900 years. This was not a simple military occupation. There was a culturation, Arabization, Arabization, Islamization. So obviously there had to be some kind of migration. Uh, but for many years, due to the particular historical trajectories of the Iberian nations, Spain and Portugal, the question of the migration necess uh, necessary to undertake the transformations of Hispania into Al-Andalus was overlooked. Uh, from the 70s onwards, a new consideration of Al-Andalus was developed in the Iberian countries, uh, while the previous concerns of scholars have been how influential or non-influential Al-Andalus have been in the history of Spain and Portugal in the 70s, the eclosion of democracies in the two countries allowed the consideration of the question of the historical significance of Al-Andalus in itself. Al-Andalus became a subject of study of, on its own, and this allowed to a large extent the creation of the archaeology and history of Al-Andalus as we understand them today. One of the questions that was open uh, in that period was precisely the, the migration of contingents of people, Eastern Arabs or North African Berbers, um, and not necessarily too large in absolute numbers, but sizable enough to impress a change in the society of Hispania uh, that will make it Al-Andalus. This change consisted, according to the seminar work uh, by Pierre Richard named Al-Andalus, in the orientalization, or that is the creation of a tribal society that will break with the patterns of its contemporaries in Europe. The ideas of the chart uh, were developed, um, refined particularly in archaeological terms, by some other scholars, in particular Miguel Barceló, and formed the core of what I have termed the formationist paradigm. That is the idea that the change that formed the Andalusian society started in small communities and then spread to the top of the society. The predominant view of migration in Spain, uh, in Spanish archaeology at the moment, however, is more in line with a different perspective on migration that I have termed the transitionist paradigm. This perspective, developed by Manuel Afien, follows the idea of the chart of the transformation of the society of Hispania, but the change that he considers more important happens at the level of state administration. And from there, it spreads top to bottom. Although both perspectives make a lot of uh, a lot about social change, their timelines, the phenomena they focus on, and their social narratives are very different. 
I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I don't. I do not believe that there is here an obligation to choose between formationism and transitionism. I think that both paradigms offer useful perspective to understand different scales of the process of formation of Alandalus. The formationist perspective, mostly concerned with trans transformations at the bottom of the society, is very interested in changes that can be documented at least since the eighth century. The transitionist perspective aims to understand the changes from the perspective of the state uh, that got its final shape in the 10th century. And therefore, it tends to disregard the 8th and 9th centuries as, transi as a transitional period. Obviously, the formationist perspective is more interested in the contribution of the migrants than the transitionist perspective, uh, because the transitionist perspective considers change as the ultimate result of an autochthonous process of uh, state formation. So the question will be, why do Spanish scholars tend to prefer the transitionist perspective? Uh, there are mainly two reasons. Um, one of them is that it is very difficult to date changes in material culture to the 8th century because of the scarcity of the evidence. And therefore, most theoretical approaches in the field tend to consider it as simply transitional. I would call it ontologically transitional because it cannot be any other thing than transition. So, for example, Miguel Alba and Sonia Gutierrez Lloret suggest that 8th century Al Andalus is a multi ethnic space full of social confrontation and dominated by a transition that ends in a reality that is very different to the starting scenario. Rather than reconstructing a fixed picture of this space, it is interesting to consider its diachronic process in itself, which is particularly fruitful if looked at from its future, as we know what it becomes, and from its past, as we know what it had been before. Another reason uh, is that the, for the Spanish scholars' preference for the transitionist perspective is its emphasis on autochthonous developments, because that scares away the ghost of diffusionism. In other words, uh, the transitionist perspective avoids the simplistic use of migration as a reason for change. So, for example, Elena Serrano Herrero et al. state that it will be sensible to avoid establishing a close link between changes detected in material culture and processes of migration which certainly has some impact, although its relevance in demographic terms could have been exaggerated by historians and concerned with providing an acceptable minimum of material evidence. In fact, formationist perspectives have been openly accused of diffusionism by other scholars like Eduardo Manzano in 2017. I don't think this is however correct. Uh, formationism, at least in the sense exposed by most scholars, is more akin to the multiscalar perspective of migration defined by Susan Hackenberg. New approaches, that is from 1990s onwards, have become critical of a God's high perspective of migrations as large scale processes which take place independently from individual or local agency. And as a response, they are frequently adopting a multiscalar notion of mobility. That is, a big picture is assembled from local evidence for migrations without denying the relevance or even centrality of a small scale variation to a larger scale understanding of mobility. Crucially, these approaches uh, no longer simply see migration as a vector for change, but as a complex phenomenon worthy of a study in its own right. This notion of assembly local evidence is crucial for the question of Al-Andalus. Uh, we know for sure that the migration that shaped Al-Andalus were not large scale movements of people, uh, what David Anthony called in 1990, waves of advance. Uh, rather, they involved processes of leapfrogging, that is a, a migration that is aimed to a particular place that is known because explorers have been sent in advance, or streamlining, uh, and that is groups that travel to particular places where previous migrants of the same group have settled. There will be a lot of reverse migrations too, and that will help to establish a continued communication between the migrant groups and their place of origin. The written sources point to these models of small-scale mobility. For example, we have evidence of at least three waves of migration of Arab groups and one Berber group in the 8th century. But normally, the information is allowed more scarce, more like a background noise, both from Arab and Berber groups. The sources mention them, and the toponymy offers clues about their existence. But we know nothing about numbers. Although there are suggestions of uh, people arriving in the written sources, 
We do not know how many of them stayed, how many left, and we must assume that uh, some of the most important movements happened over long periods of time and were largely undocumented. Bioarchaeological analysis has allowed to identify individuals as participants in the migrations in some contexts. Uh, by bioarchaeological, I mean not only DNA, although that too. Uh, for example, we have North African individuals, some of them women identified in, the, in, in South France and the excavations in Northern Spain. Some studies have started to adventure some ideas about the genetic history of Iberia, but these analysis cannot give reliable numbers of migrants either. I'm highlighting this study here uh, precisely because it explicitly acknowledges the complexity of the situation and because its results tend to agree what we know about migration through other sources. But maybe I confess I like it precisely because of that. As an archaeologist of Al Andalus, however, I'm not so interested in determining numbers of migrants. I think that contrary to many other cases of studies on migration in archaeology, we can agree easily on the terms of migration that Guichard already established in the 1970s. Not necessarily a lot, but in numbers enough to produce social change at large scale. My main concern is actually to understand what social change means in this case. And I think that the study of material culture is very useful for that, as long as it is done in an adequate scale and with the mind open to the possibility of migration. Uh, let me put here the example of ceramics. Um, and you knew this was coming because it is in the title of my presentation. There are full typologies of Andalusian ceramics, and in general, a lot is known about them. However, the question of how we go from the post Roman or pre Islamic tradition of ceramics to an Islamic tradition is something that has not been satisfactorily considered. To a large extent, I think this is mainly a problem of the transitionist paradigm. Transitionists search for a general cause or set of causes for the transformation of the pre Islamic to the Islamic society, rather than looking to understand how different local circumstances aggregate in each place. Bringing in migration as a sole or major cause for this transformation is avoided as it would indeed be diffusionist. In that, instead, the causes for the transformation are looked for in a general reorganization of the society along the lines suggested by transitionist theory, and that is organization of the state, emergence of an urban world, centralization of class people in workshops, etc. So all these things happened, but they happened later, at least from the 9th or 10th centuries. So what is happening in the 8th century, which is when the first waves of migration arrived? Since the transitionist perspective is solely focused on autochthonous processes of large-scale change, it misses the final scale where the effects of migration become evident. To put it simply, the magnification of the transitionist lens is too low. So what I'm going to do in the time that I have left is to apply a higher magnification, a formationist lens to the ceramics of the Vega of Granada. To be specific, we are talking about the flat region around Granada in southeast Spain, uh, in the periphery of the United state of Cordoba. The Vega is a fluvial depression around the Genil River, a fertile space for irrigating agriculture, which has a significant history of occupation, at least since the Bronze Age. Interestingly, uh, this history seems to have been significantly altered with the Muslim conquest of the, in the early 8th century, when new Berbers and Arab settlers arrived and established themselves in the area um, and occupied new ecological niches. These new settlements do not seem to have developed at the expense of the areas inhabited by the people that were already living in the Vega. The new settlers seem to have occupied new areas, thanks mainly to a distinctive economy based on irrigation, military service to the major state, and military booty. Of course, this would not mean that the relationship between different groups in the Vega will always be peaceful. Britain sources speak about conflicts between the 8th and the 10th centuries, and a strained relationship will be expected between communities for issues like rights to access water, land, and other natural resources. In my past research, I have looked at the ceramics of seven relevant sites of the Vega, between approximately 650 and 1150. My first assessment of the ceramics concluded that between the 8th and the 10th centuries, there was a four-phase transition between a rural society to a different one, a society where urban centers occupied central places. 
This was not surprising because it had happened in other places of Al-Andalus with very clear parallels. However, there is a part of the process that is not satisfactorily explained with the emergence of the urban world. A fine reading of the four phases showed the importance of internal processes which were specific to the region. In particular, I'm going to focus on the, two te on the technological processes of ceramic production that can be documented in the first two phases, roughly between 650 and 800 and between 800 and 925. I'm going to focus on two particular fields of pottery production that I have studied in more detail. Cooking pots, and in particular the shape that in Spain we call olla, and large containers, that is vessels designed to store large amount of big tools. So what can we see in the olla? Uh, for, long periods, for, for a long period in late antiquity, at least between the 5th and the early 8th centuries, no changes are detected in the features of production of ollas in the Vega of Granada. And these features are represented by the very stable A and V rim types. In phase one, that is remember 650 to 800, we see the introduction of new morphological types. These are not important changes in form because the basic features of the olla remain the same. It's a globular profile and about two or three liters of capacity. However, this minimal morphological change is important because the new types documented, the uh, ring types S and N, have a higher neck that allows the creation of a spout. And this has an implication for the understanding of the whole kitchen and serving assemblage. Other technological changes can be noted in the modern techniques. The new shapes tend to have thinner walls and to be modeled with a higher wheeling speed. However, we need to wait until phase two 800 to 925 to document clear changes in modeling techniques. We see at least two different forms to finish the base. Wildcat, which is a traditional uh, finishing in the Vega since the pre Islamic types, uh, pre Islamic times, sorry, and a scrap basis, which is the innovation documented now. Each finishing is related to a different type of modeling technique. We also see the development of new clay recipes to compose the fabrics of which ceramics are made. Uh, research has shown that the clay recipes reflect to a certain extent the geological background of the location of the workshops in different parts of the Vega. But there are other aspects that indicate that the selection of, selection of raw materials was not only based on what was geologically available. The potters had some preferences. In spite of these technological innovations, the Cooking pots are all made in the same typology. This means that there are multiple solutions to make the same type of ceramics during phase one and phase two. Before I go on to the next field of pottery, two more things must be noted with regards to all the technological innovations detected in cooking pots in phase one and two. The first one is that they are not detected at the same time and in the same sites. Uh, the, new cooking, the new cooking pot forms are detected very early in the eighth century in the site of Granada and in Solana de la Verdeja. However, scrap bases are detected in other sites probably, and, and in other time, probably around the first half of the ninth century in three sites, Molina del Tercio, Cerro de la Mora, and Manzanil. The range of new fabrics also happens all over the ninth century and in different places of the Vega. And the second point to note is that scrap bases and new clay recipes are documented only in the new Oya types, S and N, so in the innovations. The old forms, V and A, are never the object of innovation. Therefore, we can say here that uh, the new technological developments tend to coalesce together. So you make new things on new types. Um, what about the large containers? By large containers, I refer, I, I mean the large vessels designed to store materials. In the late antique Vega of Granada, these are mainly represented by dolia, which are large vessels which appear uh, usually uh, architecturally fixed, and by paneras or testi, which are containers used for the firing of bread. Um, and, and these two elements will disappear by the end of phase one. Uh, but in phase one, we have the new forms of tinajas and alcalafes. The tinajas are smaller and lighter versions of the dolia which can be attached to architecture, but appear more frequently free and we are, and we are probably mobile up to some extent. Uh, 
In this sense, Tinajas will be considered to occupy a middle space between the Roman forms of Dolia and Amphorae. The Alcalafes are portable containers, which are usually linked to domestic or, or industrial production uh, operations that require the management of, of, of liquids like water or wine. In other words, they are large basins. Uh, in terms of fabric technologies for the large containers, we detect similar transformations to what we saw in the ollas. In phase one, as the dolia disappear, the clay recipes associated to them, which are very dense, vanish too. All the fabrics that we can document in relationship to the testy and to the new form are completely different. So we see here a, a change in the, in the direction of, of preferences for potters. In phase two, we're going to find again a, multi, a, a multiplicity of fabrics. And again, there is clear evidence that potters are experimenting with the range of materials available to them. I do not have detailed data for other fields of pottery production, but it is worth highlighting that the change of set in these two are not exclusive. We know of the introduction of other forms in the Bay of Granada between the 8th and the 9th centuries. We can identify candiles, uh, sort of lamps, and open cooking pots that we call cazuelas. And these are already in phase one. Uh, in phase two, we can identify arcaduces, which are uh, uh, the vessels used for the to move the water in the wheels, and jarritos, which are the, the, the classical jars. The multiplicity of technical solutions, both uh, in bases and in clay recipes, is a phenomenon that is also documented in other types of pottery, like the water containers that I have not described before. And we must not also uh, we must not forget that it uh, that it is at the final stage of phase two, when one of the most characteristic characteristic innovations of ceramics happens in Al-Andalus, the introduction of glaze ceramics. We do not have a clear evidence of glaze production in the Bay of Granada, but it is something that should be considered at least for phases two. And if it doesn't happen in phase two, for sure it happens in phase three. Uh, the overview of these developments reveals two important trends. Uh, the first one is, that, is what I have called technological dispersion. It consists in the introduction since very early after the Islamic conquest and over a long period of time, at least two centuries, of new technological processes. These processes are not a specific chains operatoires, sequences of operation with a defined end product. They are rather segments of chains operatoires, which could be com combined in different fashions. They are inaugurated at different times in different workshops that have different territorial reach and they sustain a multiplicity of technological solutions that can be documented at different stages. This case of sustained innovation in a short period of time is quite remarkable and shows that fast-paced change in many different directions at the same time. But not everything is dispersion, and I cannot avoid to compare this picture with the picture of Homer of, of Nisha. Not everything is dispersion. The second trend to note is one of coalescence a definite direction of the accumulated change in time. This is manifested especially in the morphological content component of the pottery. The new olla types S and M, or the new vessel shapes, tinajas and alcalafes, etc. All these uh, shapes concentrate all the innovation and they embody particular ways of doing things like cooking, washing, transporting, illuminating, etc. So they define the spheres of daily life of the new society. They take hold in the archaeological record relatively fast and eventually substitute equivalent shapes of previous periods. For this reason, technological innovations coalesce around the new types, but not around the old ones. We see new technological features about to apply to the S-type ollas, but never to the archaic V-types ollas. We see them applied to Tinajas, but never to Dolia. Therefore, these particular technological features that are manifested in morphology are extremely useful to understand in which direction the society is changing. Since the state, the Maya state, is particularly weak in the Vega of Granada in these centuries, the reason for change in this direction must be found in the internal dynamics of the Vega itself. Technological dispersion and coalescence are the material manifestation of the field of action of potters in these centuries. The concept of field of action developed by John Robb in, in 2013 help us to consider social agency within a defined sphere of life. Pottery production is deeply embedded in social life in pre-industrial societies 
with relative low levels of complexity, which will be a, a good description of the Vega of Granada between the 8th and the 9th centuries. It is therefore possible to extrapolate many of the characteristics of the potter's field of action to a wider level. I will propose that this is a society that can be considered under the paradigm of middle ground in Gosden's classification of cultural contact, uh, a classification that he developed in 2004. Uh, middle ground is applied to cultural encounters where two or more groups from different social backgrounds meet in a more or less level ground of interaction in a way that there is room for the development of new forms of engagement with material culture. And this will be the innovation. That does not mean that power relations do not exist or that one group does not have preeminence over the other. What it means is that these inequalities do not hinder the development of these new engagements. And to a certain extent, they might contribute to them. Okay, so I'm close to my conclusion now, and I would like to return to the point of this talk. What does uh, this all mean in terms of migration in the Vega of Granada? Uh, I think that the process of technological dispersion and coalescence are two complementary aspects of social change that started with the uh, conquest of, of Al-Andalus by, by the Muslims, and in which migration plays an important, but not an unique role. To explain sustained change, uh, the arrival of migrant groups has to be considered in combination with the interaction with other groups within and outside Al-Andalus and at different scales, from the local to the regional and even, and even the global in the Islamic period. I think it is safe to assume that the only possible explanation for the introduction of new technological processes early in the 8th century is the arrival of migrant groups. However, we keep on documenting innovations all over the 8th and the 9th centuries, and not all of them were necessarily introduced by migrant groups. I will say that the more that we are passing time, the more difficult it is to tell if these innovations are due to the arrival of new groups or to other processes of interaction and exchange of ideas between groups of different backgrounds. Uh, living in Al-Andalus, within the Vega or in different regions of Al-Andalus, or with groups living outside Al-Andalus, which have frequent contacts with the groups in the Vega. However, the fact that the exchange of ideas and technologies is happening is part of the aspect of coalescence of technologies. That is the definite direction in which the new society is going. Uh, so this will be in itself a testament to the success of this migration process. And by success, I mean the transformation of the society of the Vega to make it fully part of the networks of the Islamic world. Um, with that, I would like to finish my presentation and I open for questions and delay. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs>